Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're taking a look at an Astrotech AT60ED, a 60mm f6 ED doublet refractor, and what has to be the cutest telescope I think I've ever had in here. Now this was sent to me by a viewer, thank you very much, you know who you are, and about the same time that I knew this was coming in, I ordered some books. And one day when I came home from being out, I saw this box sitting in the driveway, and I assumed this was the books, but no, there's an entire telescope optical tube assembly inside this little box, and it has this fitted foam. And I think if you wanted to, you could probably make a nice soft or hard-sided case based on some of this fitted foam that's inside. So let's take a look and see how it performs. Okay, so I just did want to emphasize again how tiny this telescope is. You see a 12-inch ruler here, but this isn't the Astrotech AT60. This is not the telescope I'm reviewing. Rather, this one is the AT72, the bigger brother to the telescope that I'm reviewing. And if you want to see the AT60 in comparison, that's what it looks like. This thing is really, really tiny and cute. So let's go ahead and get this out of the way, and we can talk about the scope in question. So it does have a extendable dew shield. That makes it look a little bit bigger. Metal cap, that's good. And you'll see a 60 millimeter F6 FPL 53 doublet. The coatings look quite good. On the back here, you'll see all of the things that are on you. This is sold as an optical tube only at the time of filming. $419 US. You are going to need to supply the finder, the diagonal, the eyepiece, and of course the all-important mount. Now this is a standard finder shoe here, so you can put anything you like on here. I've got this red dot reflex finder from Orion, and that slips in here like this, and you can have it like that. Now the focuser is quite nice. It's a two-speed focuser, and you just may be able to see this, but there are graded markings on there. That is quite welcome. Look at the bottom of the focuser, and you'll see that this is a quality item. The action on this feels very smooth, and it came adjusted from the factory really, really well. We have a, loosen this, rotatable focuser. Very nice at this price range. We have a two-inch visual back with a two-inch to inch and a quarter adapter out here, and you'll notice that everything here is a compression ring. There are no set screws to mark or mar your diagonal or your eyepiece. So you can put this in here like this, and if you want to, let's go ahead and put an inch and a quarter diagonal and an eyepiece, and this is a combination that I did use, and it works quite well. Put it on the mount just like that. Now if you wanted to, you could take all of the inch and a quarter stuff out and, well, let's just go ahead and go for it. This is a two inch diagonal and a 26 millimeter Nagler type five. Might as well just go for it, right? Now, this may seem like decadent overkill to you to do something like this, but you know me, I happen to love decadent overkill. I've had people ask me, what does the scope weigh? And it's a little bit of a difficult question to ask because, answer because what it weighs depends more on what you put on it than the optical tube itself. I'm weighing the optical tube empty by itself at around 3.6 to 3.8 pounds, but if you put all this stuff on here, this can easily come to close to seven pounds. Okay, so let's take this off for the time being. Let's take off the finder for the time being, and let's look at this. So on the AT72, you notice you had two spaced rings with holes at the bottom that you could put a plate on. Well, this mimics what's on the previous version of the AT72. There is one ring with a mounting foot at the bottom with three tapped holes here. So the question becomes, what if those holes don't match up to a bigger plate? Like I always like to put this on a bigger plate like this. And actually those holes don't match up. You could put one screw in, but you don't want to put one screw in. You want to put at least two in there. Well, if you wanted to do that, there is a large knob here, and this enables you to remove this ring, like this. Now, if you remove the ring, the question becomes, do I have access to other rings which will fit this optical tube? And yes, I found some 
These are the 76 millimeter rings from Orion. They have had these in the catalog for a very long time. Hope they keep them there. And they cost, well, they cost next to nothing. <laughs> so you could put these on here like this. And now because you can slide these rings back and forth to match whatever spacing it is that you want to do, you can, this is a, look like as a plate from scope stuff that I got, space this so that you can mount it on a plate of your choosing. One reason you may not want to use this ring, um, it's beside the fact that there's only one ring here, a little bit less mechanically stable, is some people don't like to mar this surface here by having the mount bite into the side. So all in all, for the money, it looks like they've checked off all the boxes. It is very well made. Let's take it outside and go observing. Now this thing is small and light enough that you can put this on any number of mounting options. You could if you wanted to put it on a photographic tripod, but as I've advised people before, a photographic tripod should be a stopgap to you getting a real telescope specific mount. These things are designed to be used with telescopes. So if you wanted to, you could put it on this Vixen Porta. You've seen this thing before and you just put it on like this and you've got slow motion controls and it will move up and down and left and right. Now I do wanna caution you here. This thing is a victim of its own tiny cuteness. <laughs> what happens is if you put anything of substance on the back of the telescope, it becomes back heavy. So whatever plate you put it on, make it a longer plate. This one actually doesn't have enough back travel on it, but I've got it rigged for the equatorial mount here. This is my Celestron AVX. You have all seen this here before. So I've, this is the way I normally used it and I have the full benefit of tracking and go-to. Now, I know most of you are going to be buying this thing for imaging, either to image through the telescope itself or by using it as an auto guider. Now, of course, we're going to get to that, but I was determined to look through this thing first, right? What a concept, looking through our telescopes. So I have had people ask me, you know, what is the star test like? How are the optics? And I'll tell you, on these, let's call them better Chinese source products, I haven't found the need to do that because most of them are quite good. However, on the last two Astrotech AT72s that I had, both the Mark I and the Mark II, you can check out the reviews, I found moderate to somewhat serious spherical aberration on both of those telescopes, the Mark II being worse than the Mark I. Because of that, I have subjected this thing to a star test. And lo and behold, yeah, it's got spherical aberration. <laughs> it's not as bad as the 72s, but it is noticeable if you know where to look. The undercorrection is between a quarter wave and the half wave diagrams in Souter's book. In reality, in most uses, for general purpose uses, are you gonna notice any of that? No, but I thought it's worth reporting. Now with a 60 millimeter aperture, you're gonna run out of light pretty fast and you're gonna run out of things to look at. However, if you wanted to sweep through, say, the Milky Way and Cygnus or Sagittarius or Cassiopeia, it's a lot of fun, even if you don't know what you're doing. With this eyepiece, this is a 19 millimeter teleview panoptic. It is quite good. It's a lot of fun just to sweep around. I also find if I have a larger telescope that I have out here, say a six to 10 inch Dobsonian or an eight inch schmidt Cassegrain, something like that, I'll sometimes bring along something like this as well as a second telescope to for quick peeks. So what can you see with this thing? Well, the brighter deep sky objects are good. The double cluster, it's summertime right now, not a great time. Uh, the Lagoon Nebula, the Triffid, and the Swan Nebula in the Sagittarius area are pretty good. I can see M81 and M82, but they're starting to get to the limits of the limited light gathering ability here. I can see M65 and M66 and NGC 3628 in LEO. That's getting near the limit of what I can do here on these Bortle four and a half or so skies. Again, you can see them, but as far as seeing any detail, now forget about it, just object identification is enough there. Now for imaging, you can start with the moon. Now, I don't think this is a great lunar imaging telescope, but there's no th reason why you can't use this as a learner. And I have this ASI 120MM. You've seen this thing before. This one is the Dash S variant. And you can put it in here and run the capture through SharpCap and process the image through Registax or AutoStackert. 
So for imaging geeks out there, I'll give you two pieces of information. Number one, although there is a great deal of focus travel in the focuser, I found there wasn't enough to bring the camera into focus. I had to use an extension tube. All I did was unscrew the lens on a Teleview Barlow and just put that in there as an extension tube. The second piece of information is despite the small size of the sensor, the fact that we're only dealing with 360 millimeters of focal length means that the entire moon will fit on this sensor. Go ahead and try that out. Do webcam lunar planetary? I would lean towards the lunar part of that, again, mainly as a learner. Planetary? Nah, not so much. You're going to run out of light. You're going to run out of focal ratio and focal length. Uh, you can give it a try, but I'm not sure how great that's going to be. Now, if you wanted to do deep sky imaging, which is what I think most of you are going to do, you can if you want to. This is the rig that you've seen me use before. This is my Hutech modded EOS 5D Mark III intervalometer here. And I have an auto guider that I move to the front of the telescope here. That's why this mount has such a long extension tube. And off you go. Another piece of geeky trivia, if you have one of these mounts, the four pound counterweight is enough to balance all of this stuff and no need for the seven pound or the 12 pound counterweight. So, you know, visually, I refer to these things as half hour telescopes because in about 30 minutes, you're going to see pretty much everything you're going to be able to see in a scope of this size of this aperture. This can be a good thing if you're pressed for time or if you don't want to commit an entire evening to it, you can just go out with this knowing that you're not going to be out for very long. Now, as for imaging, those moon images I showed you before, it was clear many of the next few nights and the next thing you knew, I was in a project. So I did get this eight image mosaic of the moon. You can see some of those nights were better than others. Those of you who do the moon know what a pain this can be. Once the moon gets to full or past full, you have to start getting up around two in the morning just so that it's highly placed enough for you to look at it. Now, as for deep sky imaging, I don't have the dedicated field flattener for this. They actually make one that's just for this telescope and it's not very much money. I didn't buy one because the scope isn't mine and I wasn't sure what I would do with it after I send this back. But I do have two other field flatteners here. I have the Teleview, which I use quite a bit, and I have another one that's actually labeled AstroTech that I've used quite a bit. So both of these worked pretty well. There is some distortion at the edges, and I don't know if this is going to be true if you have the dedicated field flattener. So I'll show you here. This is an integrated image of NGC 281. That's the Pac-Man Nebula. And you can see on a full frame sensor that the edges are a little bit distorted. Luckily, you can crop in. The Pac-Man is quite small and you can sort of hide the fact that there's distortion there. Same thing with the veil here. That is the integrated image in PixInsight. And once cropped and processed, it looks like that, and it's not too bad. Okay, so if you're committed to visual observing, do you need this thing? Well, Probably not. This falls into the category of a nice-to-have as opposed to a have-to-have. If you are into imaging deep sky and like to look at big objects, yes, this thing can be quite useful. So you can buy it for that if you want. Or you can do what one person said when he came over here to look at this during the review period. He said he was going to buy it just because it's cute. Thanks for watching.